All right, this is video 21. Uh, it's about the video, uh, the article by Desmond and Gershenson on housing and job loss. So uh, let's just get started by looking at their primary thesis, which is stated fairly straightforwardly. Analyzing novel survey data of, a predominantly, lo of predominantly low income working renters, we find the likelihood of being laid off to be 11 to 22 percentage points higher for workers who had previously experienced a forced move compared to observationally identical workers who did not. Uh, another way that they put it is applying matching techniques as well as discrete hazard mod models to novel survey data of low-income Milwaukee renters. We find forced removal to be a fine uh, a strong and robust indicator of job loss. So those are both really wordy, but they come down to the same thing. Being evicted causes job loss. It's easy enough to understand how um, job loss can lead to being evicted. That is, you lose your job, you don't have money to pay your rent, you get thrown out on the street. But it turns out that uh, the reverse causal relationship is not only something that exists, it's significantly stronger. So essentially what we're investigating here is a phenomenon that has been called double precarity. Um, this is, I'm just going to call this mutually reinforcing uncertainty in both, mutually reinforcing uncertainty in both housing and employment. Basically, a lot of people are um, insecure in two ways. They are housing insecure and they are job insecure. And these two forms of insecurity reinforce each other. <laughs> Statistically speaking, this double pre precarity is more likely to impact young men, people with less education, and African Americans. And if you lie at the intersection of two or more of those categories, it becomes a huge problem. So the information that Desmond and Gersenshin Ger Ger are using is taken from the Mars survey. And we've seen this before in Desmond and Schulenberger. This is the main bit of the foundational bit of st statistical research that Matthew Desmond and his colleagues did while writing Evicted. And so it's based on 1,086 individuals um, surveyed in Milwaukee who are renters. Um, and those um, individuals were picked by what he calls a multi-stage, by what he calls multi-stage stratified probability sampling. So uh, we already looked at the Mars survey a little bit when we were talking about Desmond and Gers Gersens or Desmond and Schulenberger, who identified that there were more evictions out there than people really uh, took, understood. Uh, but I want to review some of this anyway, and just also review some of the basic statistical um, ideas. So one thing that's always important to do is remember that the sample is not the population. Uh, when you do a study, you never study all the individuals. The only big exception I can think of is the U.S. Census, which attempts to do an, act, an actual enumeration of everyone in the United States. But more generally, there's a population that you want to know about. This is a large group of people. And then there's the sample, which is the smaller portion of the population that you actually have knowledge of. And so one of the key things to understanding statistical reasoning is to pay attention to how the sample is drawn out of the population. You're never looking at the whole world. You're just looking at some sample of it. The ideal form of sample is what we call a random sample. This is a sample in which each member of the population has an equal chance of being in the sample. 
that is mathematically defined um, and that can then just be the perfect sample. The real world is messy though and very often things that you are relying on for information about the world were not acquired through completely random sampling. So two common and less good forms of sampling are the self-selected sample and the sample of convenience. A self-selected sample is a sample in which people choose to be in the sample. Phone-in polls are like this. Self-selected samples are always heavily biased toward um, extremes. Um, so self phone-in polls and political uh, surveys overrepresent partisan views. Uh, another kind of sample is the sample of convenience. This is the sample of individuals that just happen to be accessible to the researcher. And this is uh, something that is really common in psychological surveys. A lot of psychological knowledge, our body of knowledge of psychology, was conducted by studying uh, first-year undergraduates in intro to psych courses. And this um, also has a bias to it. What we're looking at here is a stratified sample. And a stratified sample is cl closer to being a random sample than either of the two previous methods. Stratified sample is a sample where the population is divided into specific subgroups to ensure that a appropriate subpopulations are represented. So if you want to be sure that there are an adequate number of African Americans in your sample, you just divide the overall population by race and be sure that you sample a certain number of African Americans. So the 1,086 individuals uh, selected by multi-stage uh, in the Mars survey were selected this way. And so this is from Desmond and Gersension, but the same description is given in Desmond and Schulenberger. Uh, drawing on census data, Milwaukee block groups were sorted into three strata based on racial composition. So they divide the blocks up into white, black, or Hispanic, um, if at least two thirds of their residents identified as such on the census. Um, then those blocks were further divided into high and moderate poverty. Um, and then uh, blocks were randomly selected from each of those six strata and interviewers would then visit every household in the selected block targeting uh, saturating target areas and their response rate was 83.4 percent which is pretty good I mean think about it going just door to door trying to talk to everyone on a block and you manage to get 84 percent of them to actually talk to you and give you their um, uh, history of, uh, well, both their employment and their housing history. So we're looking at 1,086 individuals that were uh, selected by multi, s selected by this method. Um, but people who did not have a job in the last two years were removed from the sample. And this is because if you're trying to measure whether job loss cause whether eviction causes job loss um, you need to have been talking about people who have a job to lose all right now let's circle around to looking at Gire's model of a scientific episode this is taken from his book um, understanding scientific reasoning the big thing that he does with the semantic view of theories is try to understand the difference between the real world, which is real, and our representation of the real world, which is always simplified in some way. So we get four boxes. We have the real world, um, and then we interact with that in some way to get data. That's all on the side of reality. On the side of our representation, we have a model and predictions based on that model. So Here's our claim. The likelihood of being laid off um, 
is between uh, 11 and 22 points higher for workers who e previously experienced a forced move. So we've got a real world that we're dealing with. The real world is everyone who rents in Milwaukee, um, or perhaps just low-income renters. It's how far past the uh, sample we want to generalize is difficult sometimes. Um, and I've mentioned before that I think generalizing from, for instance, Milwaukee to Lorraine or Illyria or Cleveland wouldn't be that bad. Whereas um, generalizing from Milwaukee to, say, Los Angeles or San Francisco might be different. But in any case, you then have the Mars survey interacts with the real world, and that gives us our data. And our data in this case is now 698 people interviewed. Okay. So, of these 600, uh, it looks like I reversed it in the previous slide, it should be 89. Um, of these 689 individuals, um, they were uh, asked to give a complete residential history for the last two years. Uh, a sequence of six questions was used to identify forced moves in order to find situations where you might not say, oh, it was a forced move, because, for instance, the courts weren't involved, but really it was a forced move. And then the residents uh, gave their employment history, again, for the la next, uh, the previous two years. And they had a calendar there to remind people, and there's evidence that um, actually, people's recollections of major life events over the last two years um, is good, especially when you give them a prompt, a visual prompt like a calendar. So we have the real world, we have the data, and now we have a model of the real world. Uh, and it says fit, but it doesn't actually fit yet. Um, the model just consists of two variables. Was there a forced move? was their job loss. Each of these variables takes two values, yes or no, right? Um, this is then used to make a prediction. The prediction is that the variable forced move will explain the variable job loss. So what we're doing here is actually um, creating a causal model. And a causal model is uh, the, one of the hardest things in science, especially social science, to, to develop. We talked previously about distribution models, correlation models, and causal models. Distribution model simply says how common a trait is in a population. So um, when we f say that one in eight Milwaukee renters experienced a forced move during a two-year period, that is a distribution model. It says how widely a property experiencing a forced move is distributed amongst a population, Milwaukee renters. Correlation models give a relationship between two distributions, right? So. Uh, we find that uh, families with children are more likely to be evicted than families without children. Um, so there are two distributions, the number of families with children and the number of families experiencing eviction. And we find that actually, um, if you have a child in your family, you are more likely to be evicted. Notice that this does not indicate on its own causation, although all already while you were thinking about um, uh, children and landlords, you might be thinking, yeah, the landlord doesn't want to rent to a family with children because the child will mess up the property. Um, and what you've done there is you've moved from a correlation to a causation. Um, and that is actually a difficult move um, epistemologically. It, it's not always a reliable inference. And so the standard example here is smoking, lung cancer, and ashtrays. 
So back in the day when people used to smoke indoors, you would have ashtrays all over a house. Um, and it turns out that the presence of ashtrays correlates with the presence of lung cancer. If you've got ashtrays all over your house, it's likely you're more likely to have lung cancer. However, the ashtrays are not causing the lung cancer. The lung cancer is caused by a third thing, which correlates with both ashtrays and lung can cancer, that is smoking. So um, we need to judge, we need to make further effort, we may need to do further investigation to determine whether uh, one thing causes another in a correlation. Uh, whenever two things are correlated, it could be causation goes from A to B or from B to A, or there could be a third thing, C, that causes them, or there could be even more letters than that, and things get really complicated. So nevertheless, we know just already, based on this data, that um, job loss and forced moves are correlated. That is, if you experience a forced move, you are more likely to also experience a job loss. So the next step is to see how Desmond and Schulen, or Desmond and Gersenschen move to causation. And actually, um, there, there's a, there are two fairly complicated mathematical techniques they talk about here, uh, matching and discrete hazard modeling. But I'm just going to talk about the more common sense thing. When you move from correlation to causation, one obvious thing that makes the um, that makes causation likely is that causes happen before effects, right? And as it turns out in our popul in our survey, we're looking at a lot of cases where people lost their job, uh, people were forced to move first, and then they lost their jobs. But still, we need to get a little bit farther in. We need to say, uh, talk about how um, we move from correlation to causation here. Um, and so this is what Desmond and Gersenschen say. To promote causal inference, we used two matching techniques. Matching improves balance by pruning observations for which there are no good comparison and weighting those that remain. So what they did, let's go back actually to the, oh, I'm going the wrong direction. Let's go back to this diagram here. We've got two variables, um, and one of them we're gonna, will divide us essentially into um, the control class and what you, what, Desmond calls the experimental class, although there wasn't actually an intervention. Uh, it is the class that has the potential cause. That is, there is a forced move, right? So you've got two groups, forced move, no forced move. Individuals in these groups were matched by according to other properties so that we could see whether there is some third factor floating around that might actually be the relevant cause. So if we were looking at, if we thought we were looking at smoking, something like smoking, an actual cause, but really we were just looking at ashtrays, an, incident, uh, a cor an accidental correlation, we should be able to find the third factor, smoking. So um, one of the things they did is they matched people a couple different ways and they used st some statistical modeling. They also used something called discrete hazard analysis. We don't need to dive into all of these details. Um, but the bottom line is, actually before I get to that, I just want to say they were able to show that um, you can explain causation, you can explain the um, job loss in terms of previous eviction and rule out other factors. So other factors they looked for, for instance, were um, relationship loss, people, people get divorced, that might cause both losing your job and your apartment, um, and also a history of job loss. So once you lose one job, it becomes easier to lose more. 
And um, so those are third factors that they were able to rule out in this way. But here's a bit that I think is interesting for more, um, uh, so from a sociological, pers political perspective. Almost half the forced moves we captured had little to do with the income, tenants' incomes being too low or the rent being too high. So now remember, if you're thinking that job loss causes eviction, you're thinking that this is happening because the person has lost their source of income. But a lot of the time, that is actually not why people are being evicted. They're not being evicted because uh, they can't pay the rent. They are being evicted, rather, because landlords are either exerting control of a property or losing control of their buildings to a lending institution. So exerting control by removing tenants. Um, that's what, so it's, it doesn't have to do with the tenant at all or you know, whether or not they deserve to be ev evicted. It, it has to do with the politics that's going on with the landlord. Right, so what you see is eviction happens for some other reason that has nothing to do with a tenant, like the building being bought out, and then that leads to job loss. So they find strong effects going in one direction, but weak to null effects in going the other. The ordering of the events matters. So, um, Next, next week, if you're following these videos in order, we're going to be looking at um, uh, what sometimes gets called culture of poverty or this issue that says that um, poor people's behavior um, is what keeps them poor. In particular, something called uh, things like reckless spending. And what we're going to see is that there is a there's circular causation here. So this is the diagram. It's a preview for next week. Um, uh, you've got two effects here, being poor and spending money recklessly. And what Desmond asserts is that although reckless spending, throwing your money away, can make you poor, what's far more common is for poverty and the feelings, associated feelings of hopelessness and the sense that there's no point in planning for anything, poverty causes reckless spending. The... the um, the causation in one direction is much stronger than the causation in the other. Well, the same is true for eviction and job loss. Both of these factors cause each other, but it turns out that eviction is much more of a driver of job loss than dr job loss is for eviction. And eviction turns out to itself be driven by outside causes. All right, so that is the basics of what you need to know about the uh, Desmond and Gersantian article. Um, there's, there are more details about how they um, make the move from correlation to causation, but we don't, want, we don't need to get into that level of detail. This should be enough to help you do the exercise and um, that sort of thing.